Hello, everybody. My name is Gabrielle Guinier, and I'm Head of Environmental Sustainability at BT. Uh, thank you for joining us today at our Carbon Footprinting webinar. And we are joined with by a special guest, Andy Stevens, who is Associate Director at the Carbon Trust. But first of all, we'd like to do another poll live to get to know you a bit better. So could you please let us know what industry you're working in? So it seems to me um, that uh, most people are in the communications industry. Um, but so thank you everybody and a welcome again. I just wanted to do a quick background around BT and climate action. Taking climate action is not something that's new for us. Uh, we've been on a climate action journey for almost 30 years now. We were one in the of the first companies in the world to set a carbon reduction target already back in 1992. And by 2016, we had reduced the carbon emissions intensity of our business by 80%. So we decided to be even more ambitious and we set a new target to reduce our emissions by a further 87% by the end of March 2031 and to be a net zero carbon emissions business by 2045. Two thirds of BT's carbon emissions come from our supply chain. So it's really important for us to work with our suppliers on sustainability and on reducing carbon emissions. And this year, we all have a unique opportunity to come together to tackle climate change, as in November, the UK will be hosting um, the UN Global Climate Conference, which is called COP26, uh, which will call for more ambitions and urgent action on climate change. And to me, if I look at what is the big environmental sustainability challenge in 2021, it's really about scale, because to tackle climate change, we need many more to take action, whether that's governments, uh, businesses, small and large, or uh, citizens. So how do we get more businesses to take climate action? And why is measuring your carbon footprint a good way to start? And how would you go about doing it? And what is it all about? So that leads me to Andy Stevens. I said, Associate Director at the Carbon Trust. Uh, the Carbon Trust is a not-for-profit consultancy. They provide expert advice to businesses and governments on the transition to a low carbon economy. And Andy will tell us more about carbon footprinting, a bit about Andy. I've actually been working uh, with Andy for, I think, uh, 11 years now. Uh, Andy is highly knowledgeable on carbon footprinting across many sectors, and he works with a multitude of, of companies uh, covering agriculture, food and drinks, building materials and publishing, as well as um, comms and tech and ICT. And prior to the Carbon Trust, Andy worked as an international consultant in supply chain and manufacturing and as a general manager for a software and consultancy company. So again, thank you, Andy. Thank you so much for, for being here and uh, over to you. Hi, and thanks very much, Gabrielle, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and obviously a pleasure to support BT on this. So yeah, I just, uh, this is a really sort of basic background on carbon footprinting and how as a company you, you can measure your own carbon footprint. Um, so you, as Gabriel says, the, the, the Carbon Trust, we're a not-for-profit expert consultancy working with companies and with governments. We've been around for 20 years now um, and sort of very well respected and known for our independence in providing impartial advice on how to reduce carbon emissions. And we are, a, a as Gabrielle says, a not-for-profit organization. So we're, 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 aim, we're a mission-driven 
and our aim is to accelerate the, the move to a, a sustainable low carbon economy. And so most of you will be aware of this, but it's always helpful just to sort of reiterate this. Why, why is it important to measure and control your carbon emissions? Well, here's a, a chart of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions since pre-industrial era, era. And you can see, obviously, it's increasing very significantly. The yellow color is, is CO2, and the others are, are other greenhouse gases. Um, primary methane and nitrous oxides. And you see that despite everything, the, the, the numbers are still rising, the, the emissions are rising on an annual basis, even though there was a slight lull because of COVID last year, the trajectory is still unfortunately going up. And the result of, of that is that temperatures rise. So the greenhouse gases basically trap heat in the atmosphere and that heats up the, the global average temperature. So this this is data from a number of different sources, um, um, which is presented by the Met Office um, uh, and annually updated. And that shows, although there, there are some natural cycles, you have El Nino and El Nino. Um, so there are sort of cycles over various years, but generally the trend is very much up. So compared to pre-industrial era, um, temperature has risen by over one, one degree since then. And so what we're already beginning to see the impacts of that. Uh, um, and now people are really aware because there are real impacts in terms of increased extreme weather events, increased flooding, um, in increased both hot and cold temperatures, um, increased temperature rises, more extreme in certain parts of the world than others. And these are all because of the increased heat trapped in the atmosphere and the, the global average temperature rise. And as you, again, as you're probably aware, the Paris Agreement set a, a target that we should control temperature increase to one and a half degrees. So we're getting fairly close to that. And why is one and a half degrees important? Well, <coughs> The higher the temperature goes, the more these extreme weather events will happen, the more there will be flooding, there'll be disruptions to livelihoods uh, and all the other things that come with that. Uh, and once you go above one and a half degrees, there's more chance of some of those activities happening, but also more chance of what are called tipping points where um, certainly you get irreversible changes locked in. So it's more difficult to then reduce the, the temperature rise. And so now people are talking about setting targets to keep the temperature rise below one and a half degrees and also projecting that forwards. It, ultimately, what we have to do is to reduce global emissions to zero, to net zero. So that previous slide showed that emissions increasing. We have to basically reverse that trend completely and take it back down to zero, um, which is roughly halving emissions each year, uh, halving emissions every 10 years, and, and then getting as close to zero as we can. And there will be a need to actually remove um, CO2 from the atmosphere in the future to balance out the, the additional emissions we've, we've input. So what, what is uh, a carbon footprint? Um, it's, it's basically a measurement of, of those greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. Uh, and there's different types of, of um, carbon footprints. What we're going to focus on today is an organizational one. So for a company to measure their own, what's called scope one and two emissions. There's also value chain emissions, which are also related to an organization, but outside of their own direct operations. And then a product footprint, which is looking at individual product or service over its life cycle. So we'll talk a little bit about those to get them into context. Um, and the carbon footprint is is the total of greenhouse gases. So CO2 is the most significant one, but there are others, methane and nitrous oxides are the other two major ones. And then there are other ones which primarily will, will be refrigerants such as HFCs, PFCs, and there's also called sulfur hexafluoride. Um, and you add Basically, all those together, they have different um, impacts in terms of heating or what's called global warming potential. Um, and so by factoring those 
you can add them together and get what's called a CO2e equivalent. So that's a, a carbon dioxide equivalent value um, of, of, of what the emissions are related back to the reference of tons of CO2 or, or kilograms of CO2. So we're basically measuring the emissions that are going into the atmosphere, measuring that in a, a weight of the greenhouse gases. Um, so why why is it important to do this? Uh, and for a company, and particularly for a small company, you may think, well, <clears throat> our impact's not going to be big. Um, but but so what what's one of the key things, and that that's driven a lot of companies is to reduce the cost. So most emissions are, are associated with energy. So um, use the energy um, and that costs money. So if you can reduce your energy, then you're also saving money. So that there's, there is a direct sort of business benefit to this, which is really important. Um, and then there's a various other things you, you're helping. If you're reducing waste, you're, you're not creating emissions in the first place. Um, and you optimize your supply chain and identify areas to improve products. Uh, and more and more, as people are aware of this, there, there's sort of future risks, both about supply of energy, I guess, and, and the costs, future costs of energy. So if you can more aware of that and manage that, you, you can manage any future risks. There is increasingly um, current legislation that, that is, uh, companies need to report in certain ways, certainly larger companies, and some of that legislation will also affect smaller companies and in the future is more likely to. So it's important to sort of be aware of that. And if you're already doing this, then you won't get caught out by any future changes in legislation. Uh, and the, the last point that we have to, to, to influence. Um, so obviously a lot of people do this to be able to say to their customers that look we're we're taking this uh, responsibility seriously we're measuring our carbon emissions and we are trying to reduce them also um uh, your customers your larger customers particularly may be asking you for specific information around this and what actions are you taking to do uh, uh and so it, so it's sort of part of a reputation, but it's also responding to outside uh, questions from, from external. So, so it's becoming much more common, larger companies, it's becoming sort of almost like the norm that in their annual report, they'll publish the carbon emission uh, report each year. And for smaller companies, this is also becoming common as well. So you get into sort of the slightly technical details of carbon footprinting, just so you've got the idea of it and then how you actually go about calculating it. Um, so the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the de facto standard that most companies use for, for measuring their carbon emissions against, defines three scopes, scope one, two, and three. And scope one is what are called the direct emissions. So that's emissions that you, you release directly into the act atmosphere from your own facilities or your own assets. So that could be in an office building, if you're heating that using gas, when you burn the gas, that releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, if you're a factory and there's some sort of processes, <coughs> which uh, furnaces again, which, which use um, gas or some other fuel, which, which fossil fuel, which burn and then release CO2. Or there may be some specific processes uh, um, which release uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and then there's company vehicles. So fuel used to run company vehicles, so petrol and diesel. Again, when that burns, it, it directly releases um, greenhouse gases, primarily again CO2 into the atmosphere. Then there's also under this category of scope one that there's what are called fugitive emissions. So those are basically greenhouse gases which escape into the atmosphere and primarily those will be refrigerants. So anything which uses refrigerants, there may be a small leakage uh, and annually you may go around and top that up. So those are where those refrigerants are leaking into the atmosphere, then they're, they're directly going into the atmosphere. So that's scope scope one emissions that you're responsible for that go directly into the atmosphere 
Scope two are also ones that are directly within your con control and directly relate to your operations. But they're, the emissions don't happen at, at um, within your facilities, but it's sort of the, the most common example is electricity. So you buy electricity, you use the electricity, but the emissions to create that electricity are actually generated in the power station. So they're called scope two or indirect emissions. Um, and electricity is the main one that there's also if, if you bought uh, in steam or heat, which is less common in the UK, but there may be some industrial processes where you, you do that, or maybe in some cases where there's um, district heating systems where you, you actually buy heat via steam or, or hot water. Uh, and so the, what we're going to focus on today is the scope one and two, because that's what relates directly to a company. Um, but for completeness, <laughs> uh, scope three is the what also called value chain, also called upstream and downstream emissions. So that relates to any any emissions um, that are outside of your direct uh, um, control, but but a part of your activities. So the main ones are what's called supply chain emissions. So anything that you buy, the emissions used to create that um, a, a part of that, and anything that you sell, if that also has emissions um, down downstream. So if you if you sell a product which uses electricity, your customers, when they use that product, um, will will be using electricity and, and so generating emissions. Um, th there's other categories, so the categories are listed there. So it's a, one of the more common ones that people are aware of is business travel. Um, but as you see, there, in total, there's 15 categories. Um, but we're not going to focus on that so much, but it's important to be aware of those because quite often they can actually be more significant uh, than, than purely scope one and two emissions. So typically companies, they measure their scope one and two emissions first, and then they'll go on to do a, a hotspot for the scope three so they understand where their, their main upstream and downstream impacts are and how they can influence those. And then to, to just sort of round, round this off, a product carbon footprint is very different. Um, it's looking at the life cycle of a product. So um, the, the, the different life cycle stages are shown here from raw material, manufacturing, distribution, the use phase, and then end of life dis or disposal and, and recycling. And if you're doing a product footprint, then you need to look at each of those stages, understand what are the emissions associated with most of those, each of those stages. So where, where there's materials input, what's the carbon footprint of those materials? If there's energy used for either manufacturing or transport or in the use phase, <coughs> um, and, and what happens at the end of life. So as I say, we're not we're not sort of focusing on that today, but it's really just to to make you aware of of all the different types of carbon footprinting there is. And then how to measure it. Um, so it it can seem quite daunting, and anything that you've not done before, it, it does seem more complicated. And there are some things which, which um, can probably be simplified, but in in practice, it, it's actually not that complicated. Um, sorry, skipped a slide there. Um, yeah, so for some reason the box is on the bottom, the, the numbers haven't come up on the slide. Um, so you'll just have to bear with me on this then. Um, so, uh, so calculating a carbon footprint, we don't actually physically measure the greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere. Um, so we don't, we don't sort of like put a bag around the the boiler and and, and measure how much CO2 is coming out. We use it sort of we measure this indirectly um, with what what are called emission factors, uh, and those emission factors are published. So in the UK, the UK government um, Bayes department. Um, publishes a set of emission factors annually, which actually are used sort of around the world. Other um, countries will also publish some, and then there, there's international sources, which like the International Energy Authority publish some, and the 
greenhouse gas protocol will publish some and, and various other um, as, as organizations do. But most of the factors you'll need will, will actually be within Bayes. And then there's calculators which use those factors. So you don't need to necessarily have those yourself. So what we do, we take for each emission source, and you have to imagine in, in the, the chart here that we've got two examples, one for electricity and one for diesel. And then for the activity metrics, so that's how much of that you're using. So in, in my example, I had for electricity, had 10 kilowatt hours um, of electricity and 10 liters of diesel, so keep it simple. And then the emission factors, so these, as I say, these are the ones that, uh, and they're updated each year. So the current emission factor in the UK for electricity, the, the, the national grid average one, is, is 0.233 kilograms of, of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So to get the emissions, you simply multiply that factor by, in this example, was 10 kilowatt hours, and, and you get 2.3 kilograms of CO2 for that 10 kilowatt hours. Um, so yeah, it seems like on your chart, maybe you can see it, the numbers. Um, then for diesel, it's the same. It's a different factor. It's a different metric that we're measuring in liters. Um, and again, you just multiply one by the other. So that that's sort of pretty s simple. And if you look at online calculators, that's basically what they're doing. You put in the activity data, it will multiply the emission factor, and then you add up the, the resulting emissions from each of those. Um, <clears throat> And then, so how do we apply that to scope one and two footprint? So as you mentioned, scope one includes anything where effectively where you're burning fuel um, or, or there's process emissions or fugitive emissions. So we've given some examples here. So fuel combustion, the gas for heating. So you get your how much gas you're using from your utility bill, or or some people might have metering of, of that if they, to be more precise, and certainly in, in some sort of factories that, that would be quite common. Um, and then for your own transport vehicle fleet, so you measure ideally the amount of fuel, so the litres of diesel or litres of petrol, or if you don't have that, then you can use uh, the, the distance travel number of kilometres and use a different factor. And then if you have process emissions and fugitive emissions, so process emissions will be, will be typically emissions in a, a, a factory, so not, not necessarily relevant for, a, for an SME, but, but um, cement works. Um, process of making cement releases CO2 into the atmosphere, the process of making steel also releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Some other processes similarly have some emissions created from the process. And then, as I mentioned previously, refrigerants are a common um, factor. And as the refrigerant gases have a very high, what's called global warming potential, so they're very high impact heating impact compared to CO2, even a small amount of refrigerant can give a uh, quite significant um, greenhouse gas emission. So that's scope one. Uh, and scope two is, again, for most organizations, that would be simply the electricity you purchase. Uh, and again, you can get the amount of kilowatt hours over the year that you use um, from your utility bill. Um, and again, to calculate that, you'd multiply that by the emission factor. And typically, um, companies would report this over a 12 month period. So that takes account of any seasonal averages. Uh, and you can compare one year with the next to see how, how you're performing. Uh, and also, um, quality. So the first time you do this, maybe you don't have all the data, you have to estimate some of it. And the, um, so the idea is, is as you, you do this, you improve the quality of the data from, from one year to the next uh, and measure that. And this all relates uh, to the, the way that the, this is calculated and the, the details of it are in the, what's called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Corporate Standard. I saw a picture of that up there on the left, um, which, as I say, is the, the de facto standard that, that most companies in the world use. 
So the, a minor sort of comment on scope two, which again, you may have heard of this or you may be aware of this. So the, there's two ways of reporting scope two emissions. So that's the emissions from electricity, what's called location-based and market-based. Basic location-based is just uses the average um, uh, electricity grid mix for the, for the country you're in. So for us, for the UK, <coughs> that looks at, again, the, you know, government figures will publish the, based on the utility providers, the, the mix of how much gas, coal, nuclear and renewables is used to generate electricity averaged over the year to give what, what's a, an average carbon intensity effectively of electricity, which is the emission factor that you use. Then the market based approach is where you're purchasing particular tariffs from a supplier. So this is commonly used where, where companies are purchasing green tariffs um, from their suppliers where if, if it's a, a renewable tariff and there's a renewable certificate backing that, then you can count that as a zero carbon or there may be some where, where it's not completely zero, but it is a, a, a mix or, or, or lower carbon. So that's the two difference. And the greenhouse gas protocol um, recommends that, that you publish both of those, those figures. Um, so that that's basically how how you do the the calculations. Um, there there is it, it's it might seem daunting, but it's actually not that complicated really. Um, there is quite a lot of support available and resources. So there's the the government um, climate hub uh, web, website for SMEs up there. With all the the links uh, are shown here. So that that has on it sort of various information resources. We picked out here that in the middle, a list of sort of specific sort of very simple steps that you can take to help cut your emissions from sort of sort of basic things like s switching to LED light bulbs if you haven't already done that, more more so sort of doing sort of reviewing the, your energy consumption, your your temperature settings, and so on, um, installing smart meters. Obviously, looking at, at moving to electric vehicles and, and, and lots of examples like that. We've also, the, in this series of webinars ne next week, a colleague of mine, um, David Tobin, is, is, is also going to talk through some more specific advice for energy audits and, and specific things you can do to improve the energy efficiency um, of, of your organization. And then on the, the SME Climate Hub website, there, there's also a list of resources. So we've listed that here on the right, where you can see uh, and, and click on any of those takes you to a whole list of, of other documents that, that are all available. And <clears throat> um, I've, I've mentioned previously the Greenhouse Gas Protocol standard. So that, that's available from the GHG Protocol website. Um, it's it's not a straightforward read, but if you want to understand a bit more about it, then that that's obviously the the de facto standard. I mentioned the emission factors that Bayes publishes, so that's the the, the website from the Bayes um, website of the greenhouse gas um, factors for 2020, and so they're up updated each year and the carbon for, carbon trust also has some support and advice. Um, for, for generally for companies and some targeted more at SMEs. We have a, a footprinting guide, which basically goes into a bit more detail of what I've, I've talked about today um, and points you at, at some of the other resources. And we have a, a, a very simple calculator on on our website. The link for it is, is there. And if everything works perfectly, I can give a, a quick demonstration of that now and then Gabrielle's going to ask me some some questions I think so I'll just um, show that screen should... we can't see it yet Andy no, no oh, it's just, just coming up yeah so that is that showing? Yeah, it's showing. Yep, that's showing. good. Right. So this is the 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 website. There's a carbon. It tells you a little bit about it. The 
fuel consumption, energy consumption, and air conditioning, the main things that you put in. You click on this button here, um, and it takes you to the footprint calculator. You put in your name of your company, which can be anything you like. So we could just put it company A. If I could spell. Um, you take the calendar year that you're reporting for. Um, you can also obviously do this for a financial year if, if that makes more sense. If you've got multiple sites, you can choose just one particular site. Um, and then we you can you pick the actual emissions. So if we put in electricity first, the amount of electricity that you use in the year. So that's 250 thousand that's in kilowatt hours add that on so it then it's listing the emission types here as we add them in if we then also natural gas for heating that's also measured in kilowatt hours and let's say that's 150 thousand kilowatt hours over the year um, so we've got that um, fuel from vehicles so let's assume it's a diesel fleet, and in, it's asking us for that in litres. So the amount of litres that we use in a year, let's say it's 5,000 litres of diesel. Um, and then some refrigerant gases. So the different types of refrigerant gases are listed here. Um, you'd need to know the specific ones that these are the most common. They all have slightly different um, emission factors associated with them and let's say that's five kilograms so you'd need to obviously measure how much you're topping up your refrigerants or if you if there's somebody doing that for you get the information from them um, so that's summarized here the the inputs so the amount of kilowatt hours of electricity amount of kilowatt hours of gas um, and diesel and the kilograms of, of the refrigerant gas um, then we simply just click the calculate button and it, it it basically takes those figures and multiplies them by the the relevant emission factors so that you can see here the the total amount of scope one and total amount of scope two. They're both about, in this example, both just under 60,000 kilograms of CO2 um, and a little chart there. And if you want to, you can send that to you. There are obviously another number of other calculators available, um, some um, more um, detailed ones than that. Um, but, but that, that's a sort of very, very simple get. You can get very easily use that and get a, a, a very quick um, assessment of your carbon footprint. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask about, um, I think you briefly touched on it, about net zero. So why is everybody talking about net zero and setting net zero targets? What's that all about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is really important. In order to, to keep temperature below one and a half degrees, um, we, we basically need to reduce our global emissions by about half every 10 years. So that, that will take us on a trajectory down to lower and lower each, each year. Um, and ultimately, what we need to do is to get to zero emissions. So we need to reduce as much as possible emissions from fossil fuels and then get to net zero. And what the science is telling us is that if we follow that sort of trajectory and aim for net zero by about 2040, 2050 globally, then we can keep emissions um, uh, temperature rise below one and a half degrees. And that that's a huge challenge, but it is it is actually possible um, and already sort of governments are setting targets around that so the EU and the UK both have have net zero targets 
a lot of companies now, obviously B BT has, has a, a net, set a net zero target a number of years ago. Um, a lot of companies are setting targets. So that that's sort of driving their behavior and saying, then force them to look at their emissions, sort of understand how, how can I reduce my emissions? What do I need to do? Do I need to switch to renewables? I need to re re replace my vehicle fleet with electric vehicles and so on. So that, that will then drive behavior to get to that net zero target. And it's being very much, there's a big push behind that from the United Nations this year leading up to the, the, the COP conference that, that you mentioned in the introduction. So encouraging companies, both larger companies, smaller companies, cities, governments to all set net zero targets. And there's a number of organizations, including a SME Alliance, which, which are, are working with, with different sort of organizations to, to, to encourage companies to take up and, and pledge to net zero targets. So I guess, you know, so, so the UK government has a, a net zero by, by 2050, uh, BT has a net zero target by 2045. Um, to me, what's, what's really important is that companies start setting these targets because so many things are going to have to change for us to get to net zero. So if I look at a, a company like BT, uh, our biggest challenge is going to be decarbonizing our fleet. Uh, together with OpenReach, BT has uh, the UK's second largest commercial fleet with about 33,000 vehicles. Um, and we really want to accelerate that push uh, towards electrification of, of vehicles. And, and to do that, we need policy support in terms of reaching uh, price parity on electric vehicles and having uh, the national infrastructure of, of charging points. So to me, it, it's so important that companies come together and send these kind of you know, market demand seg signals saying that we want this to happen, which I think is what we've seen, mm -hmm. for example, on, on renewable electricity, whereby just saying to electricity providers, we now want to purchase renewable electricity and that's it. Then they have to start investing in, in helping supply that. Um, so for many people in this audience, I think this is going to be the first time they start thinking about measuring their carbon footprint. So, so where do you really start? Is, is, is the best place to start in that uh, SME, in the calculator from the Carbon Trust that that you showed to us and just having a go and, and looking at your electricity and gas bill and see what you come up with? And is that the best mm -hmm. way? And then, and then how do you figure out a target? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Yeah, so is it, I mean, it is relatively straightforward. It's basically your electricity bill, your gas bill and your fuel bill. So vehicle fuels um, and refrigerants, if you have that data as well, will be the other probably major thing for most companies. <clears throat> and either use the, the carbon trust calculator or another calculator, or if, if you prefer, you can create your own spreadsheet, it's not that complicated. Um, uh, and the important thing is to measure so where where you're at at the moment so you understand that then you can see so where where's the majority of my emissions and it will vary by from one company to another depending on whether a service based so most of their emissions will be from the office um, if it's a small manufacturing then most emissions will be from the factory and is it from the heating is it from electricity for, for, for which so that then to set a target the simplest, um, again, science-based targets can can be sort of overcomplicated, but but a, a simplest way of um, the the exponential roadmap, which I know um, BT are also part of, has, has sort of very much simplified this and saying simply halve emissions every ten years. So you take where your emissions are now. In ten years' time, you need to halve that. So what what do you need to, to you as an organisation? What can you do to do that? For a lot of companies. Um, like BT have done switching to renewables is one of the, the probably the, the, the easiest things to the first things that you can do. Um, um, electrification of vehicles is, is really important, but as you say, there are challenges. So the more companies that are doing that and 
demanding that that, that happens at the infrastructures there that's better so in norway it's becoming where there has been big government incentives like half the the cars in in oslo are, are now electric vehicles um and they the countries have set targets a number of electric vehicles so that 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 will be important it's more challenging if you've got heavy goods vehicles that that there isn't the 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 commercial vehicles available at the moment but but if you're planning over 10 years you need to look at how often am i renewing my vehicle fleet um uh, and even if it's a small fleet that that's still still important so it's it's looking at the very practical actions what can you do um the the obvious thing always is is energy efficiency so we always say so the 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 best way to to reduce your carbon emissions is not to emit them in the first place so the what's <coughs> so the negawatt some people call it um so so not not actually if and, and a very simple example if you haven't already done it switching from um light, lights to led saves an awful lot of electricity it gives you a payback in within a few years financially and it reduces electricity consumption significantly so there's some, some very simple things like there's more complex things around replacing your boilers or, or looking at, at better insulation and things um, which will also help yeah no i i i would agree with uh, yeah. uh energy efficiency i mean that's certainly something that we've seen at, at bt and and which has been a big driver for the company so um obviously we we do use a a, a lot of of electricity, considering all our buildings and, and networks and data centers, but um, we've saved uh, around 358 million pounds on our electricity bill since 2009-10. So that's a, a massive saving for us just by starting to look at, you know, where is all the where is all the electricity going, and, and how can we how can we reduce that? Um, we have a question from Emily about how often should I measure my carbon footprint? So I guess, you know, you start, as you mentioned, Andy, by looking at at uh, the baseline and understanding um, where you're at. I, I know at, at, at BT, uh, we we publish our, our carbon footprint and go through all the numbers on, on an annual basis. But uh, but what, what's your view on that, Andy? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> measuring carbon emissions is basically carbon accounting. Um, and so in lots of ways, it's similar to financial accounting. And for most companies, they report their finances once a year in their annual reports. Um, but that doesn't mean it's just a one-off exercise. You're actually measuring it continually through the year. And typically, you're doing it on a monthly basis for most companies. So similarly, it's good practice for carbon accounting to do the same. You you would sort of review it on an annual basis compare one year with the next and also there are obviously seasonal differences in terms of summer and winter in terms of heating and, and different businesses have different seasonalities so it makes sense looking at a yearly basis but to keep track of it again it's very simple to collect the electricity bill each each month and the gas bill each month and the amount of diesel or petrol that you've used each month and just keep track of it on that that basis then you can see where it's going and it becomes part of the business practice to collect that data and, and measure the carbon footprint and that's typically what most most companies will do so they'll they'll measure it on a monthly basis and report it on an annual basis yeah no that that, that makes sense so so why is everybody all of a sudden starting to talk about carbon footprinting what, what what's i mean andy you and i have both been doing this uh yes um for a long time now, but all of a sudden everybody's talking about it. What What is happening? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's great. I mean, so the Carbon Trust has been around for 20 years. I've been at the Carbon Trust for just over 10, 10 years. Um, BT was one of the first companies in the world to report it, its scope one and two emissions. In fact, it was slightly ahead of the game in that it reported its emissions before the greenhouse gas protocol had been published. So it had to define its own methodology for how to do that. Um, and what we've seen is sort of like over the, particularly over the last five years, an increasing awareness and understanding of this and urgency around it. So I think a number of factors, one, the Paris Agreement 
um, just over five years ago, which um, set this um, objective of, of keeping global temperature rise below one and a half degrees, has sent a really strong signal to governments and to businesses that this is really important, this is going to happen, and to sort of get prepared for it. Um, there's been an increasing awareness of that over the last five years in sort of society as a, as a whole. I think one of the key things is that, that we are actually um, very sadly now seeing the direct consequences of global heating. Um, and that, that's sort of becoming more and more obvious in the news and we can imagine how that's only going to get worse. <clears throat> but there seems to be a sort of like everything sort of coming coming together that that um, governments are beginning to take this seriously. The, the COP um, conference this year in, in Glasgow is really important because it is the, the five year on from the Paris one and it's where governments have to restate their their national targets for carbon reductions. And so again, that's giving a heightened focus to it. And I think this is then just trickling down. The other thing that's happened quite recently is, is big companies like BT are setting science-based targets. And part of that is getting them to set targets for their scope three. So that's also then bringing in their suppliers. So the, the suppliers to the larger companies are now being asked to measure and set set their own targets. So there's a, that trickle down effect. So I think it's just a, the momentum's building up. Yeah, no, I I, I, I I would I would fully agree. And I think there's a lot more in the in the public consciousness about climate change because we can see climate change happening all around the world. Uh, we're seeing more, you know, more flooding, more storms, more extreme weather, more, more heat, um, and, and everything. And um, I think certainly at, at BT, we're also seeing a lot more customers asking for this information. And you know, what is BT doing on on climate? And we have investors um, and and others just just asking what what we're doing. Um, so, it, it, what what are really what are the main challenges then on on carbon footprinting? I think the I mean the main thing is is collecting the data and and so we we work with a lot of companies and it's always the data collection phase is is the tricky one because quite often we're asking for data that companies don't have I mean if you're a small company it's is is probably easier but if you've got multiple sites you've got electricity bills from different suppliers um, it, you don't necessarily have all the information in one place, so it's it's just adding that into the business process. That's that's probably the main challenge that we see that companies face when they're <clears throat> doing the purely collection um, and measuring their scope one and two. Going on to measure scope three is more complicated because it involves a lot, lot of other sort of looking externally outside of your direct operations and collecting additional information and talking to your suppliers and talking to your customers. So, so it, that, but that is really important because it builds up a bigger awareness of how you as, a, as an organization, what your total carbon footprint is. So, so, um, so is this, you know, um, taking climate action and, and looking at reducing my carbon footprint, is that going to cost me money? It's a very, a very good question. So people always assume that that yeah, doing something for the environment mean, means it's going to be more expensive. So the really good thing is that in a lot of cases, it's it's not going to. Um, so saving energy reduces your carbon emission and reduces your costs. Um, there, there are. I mean, obviously, as there's more sort of compliance issues coming down the line, that the companies will need to have have the resources to actually do that but again that that would be like any other thing that you have to you have to produce annual car finance financial accounts each year um you don't say well this is costing me money to have the accounts audited each year i mean that that's part of doing business um and moving to electric vehicles over the long term the costs of running electric vehicles is a lot lower both maintenance costs and the the energy costs are much lower than than from internal combustion engine vehicles. But obviously, at the moment, the, the capital cost is putting off some organisations from doing that switch, and we're hoping 
that with government incentives and as manufacturing gears up that those costs those capital costs will come down okay so final um final question andy um any particular advice and you know kind of encouragement for mm -hmm. small businesses starting mm -hmm. on on this journey I think just get on and do it. Do it. It's not that difficult. Hopefully, we, we've shown you it's not. It's not really complicated. I mean, the the other thing which I've also noticed as a big change in the last five years as well <coughs> is that companies always said, "Well, it, yeah, it's, it's good because we we've also then engage our employees, um, and that's really good." I mean, that's becoming more and more important that. Um, Thankfully, the, the younger generation really do understand this. And for them, it's really important that the company they're working for is doing the right thing. And, and most companies that we work with, they find that they're getting real so a lot of support from em, employees the, to, to help with this. So it, it not only does it not cost you very much, you've got a, a sort of a willing support there of your own employees to to help you with this um and and they they actually will, will probably be pushing you to to do this well that's great thank you so much um andy stevens associate director at the carbon trust thank you again for for joining us today and um, thank you everybody else in in our audience we really hope that you learned something new please reach out to us on, on social media and let us know how you enjoyed uh, today's session. So as I said in the beginning, I think this year is really about building scale. And my hope is that we're gonna get many more uh, small businesses involved in taking climate action and in looking at carbon footprinting. Um, so to help small businesses across the UK uh, take the first steps, we're encouraging you to sign up to the SME Climate Commitment. Um, as Andy mentioned, you'll find more by visiting the UK Business Climate Hub, which is an initiative set up by the UK government, and that's designed to provide guidance to small businesses on setting net zero target, measuring emissions, developing climate strategies um, and you know as Andy mentioned how can you what are some easy steps to reduce em emissions um, we also ask you to spare a moment to complete our super quick uh, feedback poll that is on the screen right now so we can keep improving these events for you if you want to rewatch the session I think uh, you will have seen there is a, a YouTube link that was posted in the Q&A and um, as Andy mentioned, our next BT Climate event will be on the 22nd of June at 10.30, uh, where we will be with David Tobin from the Carbon Trust and discussing energy audits um, and guidance for small businesses around that. So um, there will be a registration link in the, uh, in the chat as well. And thank you all so much for joining us today and uh, see you soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye.